Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Professor Charles uh, Burnett is Professor of the History of Islamic Influences in Europe at the Warburg Institute, University of London. He is also the co-director of uh, a new organization, the Center for the History of Arabic Studies in Europe, CHASE. Now, after the lecture, I hope we'll have time for um, questions and answers, uh, but I think, without further ado, I should invite Professor Charles Burnett to come and deliver his lecture, The European Discovery of Arab Culture. Charles. Okay, well, I'm very um, honored to be uh, speaking in front of you in such a distinguished place and to such a distinguished audience. From the early 8th century onwards, the Middle East, the southern shores of the Mediterranean Sea, and most of the Iberian Peninsula constituted the Arab world. What we're talking about then is the discovery by Europeans of the culture of the people of these re regions, a culture expressed primarily in the Arabic language. Europeans had contact with this world primarily in three areas, in the Iberian Peninsula, in southern Italy and Sicily, and in the Middle East. And these contacts, of course, increased as they recovered areas previously under Islamic rule, which occurred at roughly the same time in the three regions, in Sicily, with the Norman conquest of Palermo in 1072, in the Iberian Peninsula with the conquest of Toledo in 1085, and in the Near East with the First Crusade at the very end of the 11th century. The mingling of Arab and Christian populations in the same or contiguous areas led to the infiltration of some aspects of Arab culture among Christians at the popular level. The transmission of Arabic musical instruments, the lute, the rebec, the nakas, still retaining Arabic um, terms, the influence of Arabic poetic forms on European ones, the penetration of arts and architectural forms, the adoption of certain forms of magical practice, such as onomacy, the onomancy that Michael Scott in the early 13th century mentions as being practiced by skilled women in the streets and alleys of Tunis, and divination by sheep shoulder blades, for which we have single sheets, sahifa, giving a picture of the shoulder blade and the significance of each part of it. This is just a single sheet, and you can see exactly as a shoulder blade, and each part has a particular significance for the country and for the family from which the sheep has been taken. But what I'm concerned about this afternoon is not these popular influences, but rather the intellectual or literary interests on the part of Europeans in Arab culture. In the early 12th century, Adelard of Bath, an Englishman, writes a text on natural science in which he promises to relate something new from his studies um, of Arabic. Um, he has been on an intellectual journey and has taken, which has taken him both to Sicily and to the Principality of Antioch, which he probably visited in the wake of the First Crusade. And now, in this text, he characterizes Arabic studies as being new and exciting, in contrast to French studies, which he regards as being traditional and boring, relying entirely on authority. Whereas Arabic studies rely on rational arguments, on reason, ratio. For Adelard, the rational arguments of the Arabs were mathematics and natural science. He translated a whole program of mathematics from Arabic, starting with the fundamental text on geometry, Euclid's elements, and progressing through spherical geometry to astronomy and astronomical tables. Um, this is his astronomical, the first page of one of his astronomical, of one of the manuscripts of his astronomical tables. You can see at the very top there, Adelard of Bath translated the Ezek of al khwarezmi He keeps the Arabic terms for tables and for the author al khwarezmi um, And here's a sample page of astronomical tables, just lots and lots of numbers uh, indicating the movements of the planets. His translation is the first full set of astronomical tables in Latin, originally written by Mohammed ibn Musa al khwarizmi in 9th century Baghdad, but revised by Maslama al madriti in Cordoba in the 10th century. To these mathematical texts, he added the practical sciences of astrology and talisman-making. 
Meanwhile, an Italian in Antioch, Stephen the philosopher, probably arriving there because of the close mercantile connections between Pisa and Antioch, in 1127 translated a comprehensive book on medicine from Arabic um, by Ali ibn al-Abbas al-Majusi and pre prefaced it with a statement that, I quote, we have decided to devote the effort of our labor first to these books of medicine, although the Arabic language has hidden within it other things more noble than these, namely all the secrets of philosophy, to the translation of which afterwards, if God is kind, we shall devote our skill once it has become practiced. He was aware of a whole lot of Arabic texts in Antioch or in the region of Antioch which he wanted to translate. A generation later, another English scholar, Daniel of Morley, when studying in Paris, heard that Arabic learning concentrated on the mathematical sciences, the quadrivium, the fourfold path to wisdom consisting of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And in that was, it was possible to study these in Toledo. So he hastened there and was not disappointed. His experience there of Arabic works and natural science and cosmology allowed him to write a book about how the universe functioned, in which he begs his readers to accept, I quote, simple and clear opinions of the Arabs, rather than the obscure statements of Latin scientists who veil their ignorance under a blanket of unintelligibility. Daniel was a pupil of the greatest of the Arabic Latin translators of the 12th century, Gerard of Cremona, who established Toledo as the most important center of translation. His pupils described the firing of Gerard's interest in Arabic as follows. Although from his very cradle he had been educated in the lap of philosophy and had arrived at the knowledge of every part of it that was studied by the Latins, nevertheless, because of his love for the Almagest, which he did not find at all amongst the Latins, he made his way to Toledo, where, seeing an abundance of books in Arabic on every subject and pitying the poverty of Latin scholarship, out of his desire to translate these books, he thoroughly learnt the Arabic language, so that, knowing both the language and the subject matter, he read through the writings of the Arabs, and until the end of his life, he did not cease to transmit to Latinity, in a very plain and intelligible way, books on many subjects. Some of the essential texts that he translated, like Elements, Euclid's Elements, mentioned earlier, and Ptolemy's Almagest, mentioned here, as well as medical texts by Hippocrates and Galen, and philosophical texts by Aristotle, were the classics of ancient Greek science but they had become staple parts of Arab culture and texts on the basis of which Arabic scholars wrote original works. But there were elements in these works which could also inform about Arab culture. For example, in Stephen of Antioch's translation of the medical work of Ali ibn al-Abbas, one could learn about the perils of travelling in the Arabic world. I quote, If one has to travel in the heat of the day, one should protect the body with a thick layer of clothes so that the heat cannot reach the body. The head and face should be covered with a close-fitting felt cap, Pileus in Latin for Amadusis Imama turban, or the like, so that one is not breathing in warm air and harming the air passages. If at any time the traveller is harmed by cold and his skin becomes rough, he should wear warm clothing and sit for an hour in front of a fire. Then he should enter a bath and stay there for a time, after which he should enter a wash tub and water should be poured over him continuously. He should get dressed and be oiled while still in the bath. On leaving the bath, he should rest for an hour in a secluded place, then be restored with the juice from meat and white lead, but in moderation, and have a long sleep under soft, warm covers. So you have this image of the Arab traveller in this medical text. In glosses to a medical work by Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Zakaria Arazi, Gerard of Cremona describes how to make a kataif, like the, the, the Turkish um, um, sweet, which looks like shredded wheat, a fortune-telling table that indicates the activity that someone should be engaged in, depending on the side of the sign of the zodiac in which each of the planets is situated, describes a whole lot of pleasurable activities, um, uh, hearing and playing musical instruments. This is the table. 
um, including the rabab, the shawm, the horn, and various kinds of drum and singing, riding through beautiful places, smelling roses or irises, entering a bath, wearing multicolored clothing or silks or brocade, or a long-sleeved gown, hunting ducks or hares and hunting with a falcon, playing with a girl, drinking by a river, either grape wine, hammer, or date wine, nabid, and eating all kinds of delicious food, lamb, chicken, young do doves, partridges, thrushes, dates, a pie made of borage, a cake, halwa, aubergines, artichokes, dill, tafia, and mushrooms. And in this um, table we have the, the Arabic words in transliteration and the Latin translations, which are in fact above them. These references to Arabic life and daily life, as it were, um, are incidental, however, to the texts which belonged to a great intellectual tradition which stretched back to, the ancient, to ancient Greek, but also to Indian, Babylonian, and Chinese sources, and was passed on through the Arabs into Latin. The works were translated into Latin to fill in gaps or complement material in the education of students. And it was not by chance that the most productive period of translating, circa 1150 to 1250, coincided with the establishment and development of European universities and schools of medicine, where many of these works became part of the curriculum. A story is told, which sort of simplifies the, um, the situation, but is symptomatic of it, by Roger Bacon, who says that the translator Michael Scott came to Paris in 1230, bringing some books on natural science and metaphysics together with their commentaries, and thereby introducing Aristotle into the University of Paris. And we know that Michael Scott was engaged entirely in translating works from Arabic. But there were many other aspects of Arabic culture that did not form part of a teaching curriculum and were more specific to the Arab world. Among these were religious texts. In spite of living in close proximity to each other, until the mid-12th century, Christians had only a hazy picture of what Muslims believed in. The great advance was due to the abbot of Cluny, Peter the Venerable, whose goal was to defeat Islam by reason rather than by the sword. The word ratio again comes up here. And to this aim, he commissioned translations of the Quran and related literature in the 40s of the 12th century. The Quran, put into elegant Latin by the Englishman Robert of Ketton, includes some commentary, tafsir, probably provided by a Muslim called Muhammad, whom Peter the Venerable had joined to the project. But the collection commissioned by Peter the Venerable also included a catechism of the teachings of Islam, Doctrina Muhammad, an account of the descent of a miraculous light in the breast of Adam through the Jewish patriarchs and eventually to Muhammad himself, De Generatione Muhammad, a history of the first caliphs, to, to which rather unfairly um, the title Chronica Ridiculosa et Mendosa, the ridiculous and um, uh, um, error-filled chronicles has been attached, and a dialogue between a Christian and a Muslim setting out their respective beliefs allegedly taking place before the Caliph al-Ma'mun, the Apology of al-Kindi. Peter the Venerable used these materials to write his own Summa Totius Heresis, um, his sum, Summa of the Whole Heresy and the Diabolic Sect of the Saracens. This literature was typically used to attack the Muslim faith, but at least this attack could be made with full knowledge of the contents of that faith. And here's a manuscript of the collection, known as the Soledan Collection, um, and you can see the faithful translation in the middle there, made of the Koran by Robert of Ketton, and then the notes in the margin, which I'm afraid to say are all rather critical talking about blasphemy and this is false and so on. In the early 13th century, another translation of the Quran was made by Mark, a canon of Toledo Cathedral, together with the Creed and other short works of Ibn Tumart. Since Ibn Tumart had been the founder or, and Mahdi of the Almohads, who were um, then ruling um, the Islamic areas of Spain, um, Mark's translation helped to know the enemy. 
The first phase of the massive translation of Arabic text into Latin lasted roughly from the second quarter of the 12th century to the end of the 13th. Hardly any Arabic manuscripts that the translators used have been identified. It is reasonable to suppose that translators in northwest Spain used manuscripts from the library of the Muslim kings of Saragossa, both because we know some of the texts that were available in this library and because one translator, Hugo of Santalia, explicitly mentions his patron's discovery of a text that he was to translate in the Armarium Rotense, the library of Gueda, to which the kings of Saragossa retreated um, after being driven out of the capital. Mark of Toledo mentions searching through Arabic libraries um, in Toledo itself. One extant Arabic manuscript gives a text that is so close in its text and glosses to a translation of Jared of Cremona that it may be the very manuscript that he used. Since the manuscript belonged to an Italian Jewish family of translators, Harmeati, it may have become known to Jared through Jewish intermediaries, for Jews participated in the translation movement as interpreters for their Christian colleagues, and many Arabic scientific and philosophical texts belonged to Jews in Spain and Italy. How did the translators learn Arabic? When they did not depend on interpreters, they probably learned it through direct contact with Arabic speakers. We have two Arabic Latin, Latin, uh, Latin Arabic glossaries from the mid-12th and mid-13th centuries, respectively. But both of them appear to belong to a religious context, either for the sake of Arabic-speaking Christians or for the conversion of the Muslim. The Dominicans had studia for the learning of Arabic in Tunis, uh, Mercia and Majorica, uh, Mallorca and other places from the mid-13th century onwards. Ray Raymond Lull is notorious for his attempts to convert the Saracens. In an early work, the Book of Contemplation of 1272, he prays to God, when I, your servant and follower, Lord, try as far as possible to understand the Arabic language so that I can through it point out the truth to the Arabs, I ask you to give me grace and blessing to understand quickly and point out through Arabic uh, words the truth of your sacred incarnation, passion and trinity. May you give me the grace of having the dedication to praise and bless you in Arabic and of not doubting nor fearing any punishment which could be inflicted on me by any Arabic speaker. Well, unfortunately, um, uh, his worst fears came true there. He is speaking Arabic to the Sultan of Tunis and there he is being stoned for doing so. So, so that was the fate of Raymond Lull. He didn't actually die on that occasion, but could have done. Just before his death, Lull persuaded the Council of Vienne, 1311 to 12, to establish chairs in Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic at the universities of Avignon, Paris, Oxford, Bologna, and Salamanca. But unfortunately, there is no evidence that any Arabic chair was actually set up. Thus, by the end of the 13th century, the scientific and philosophical aspects of Arab culture had come to be well known, and there is a good understanding of the Islamic religion. In respect to science and philosophy, there is a sense by, the, the, by this period that Europe had caught up with the Arabic world and that there was nothing more to learn from that world. What is lacking is an understanding of Arab civilization in itself, its history, its geography, the organization of Arab society, and its literature, or belles lettres. This all changes in the early 16th century. First of all, there's a drive to improve and add to the Arabic sources in medicine, philosophy, mathematics, and astronomy partly because it was now possible to print the works and make them available to a larger readership. New texts by Avicenna and Averroes were translated into Latin, often through the medium of earlier Hebrew translations. Most prolific was the Jew Jacob Mantino, who added massively to the Latin corpus of Averroes' commentaries on Aristotle. At the same time, a few hitherto unknown works of Avicenna were translated directly from Arabic, 
by a doctor serving the Venetian embassy in Damascus, Andrea Alpago, who graces his translations with extensive notes drawn from his experience in Syria. For example, he states that the Damascenes today say that the attributes of God are distinguished in reality from the essence of God, and that a jinn or spirit is an aerial, rational animal having a transparent body whose nature is to take on different shapes. And he also mentions various Sufi orders, um, which he has got to know from his Arabic informant in Damascus. These hints of local interest find their full expression in the work of Leo Africanus, a highly intelligent and learned Muslim from Fez, who, has captured, who was captured and brought into the service of Pope Leo X, where in the 1520s he wrote his description of Africa in Italian, in the Italian that he had learned to speak. In this substantial text, he not only describes cities and monuments, but also customs and religious practices, and quoted verses from the best of the Arabic poets. Supplementing his description, he wrote a guide to the most famous Arabic doctors and philosophers, printed by Johann Heinrich Hottinger in 1664 as Libellus de Viri Scribustum Illustribus Apud Arabes, um, the little book about certain famous men amongst the Arabs. And he also, Leo Africanus, also wrote an account of Arabic prosody, the meters of poems, which has only been published in recent times. He may, in addition, have written an Arabic grammar, and he de definitely collaborated with Jacob Mantino, whom I've just mentioned, on an Arabic Hebrew Latin dictionary, which was never completed. Leo Africanus's work was taken up by Guillaume Postel in Paris, who produced the first printed Arabic grammar in 1538, followed by the Germans Jakob Christmann and Rutger Spey. Um, but these authors were primarily interested in Arabic in order to understand the Bible better. Arabic was an ancillary um, subject to Hebrew. Indeed, Guillaume Postel had called Arabic an adulterated Hebrew. It was Joseph Justus Scaliger, um, Postel's pupil, who dared to suggest that one should seek to understand Arab culture by looking at its own literature, starting with the Quran. Scaliger collected Arabic manuscripts in Leiden and encouraged students, the most renowned of them, um, of whom was Thomas van Erpe, Erpenius, professor of Arabic at Leiden University from 1613 to 24. He brought the tools for the study of Arabic to perfection by writing a comprehensive grammar, editing and translating texts for students of different levels in classical Arabic, including proverbs, fables, and portions of the Quran. A rather different enterprise had meanwhile been taking place in Rome, where the Medici Oriental Press, which functioned from 1584 to 1614, under the direction of Gian Battista Raimondi, had been producing elegantly printed Arabic texts without translations and appealing equally to an Oriental readership as to a Western one. The books were actually sold in the Ottoman Empire, the um, of 1620, in which Arabic poetry received the highest accolade, but his early death prevented him from publishing an edition and translation of the most famous of all the Arab poets, al Mutanabi. The first Arabic poem was published by his pupil, Jacob Golias, in 1629. Um, this being the Lamiyat al-Ajam, a poem, according to Franz Rosenthal, of outstanding depth and beauty. Like a typical Arabic Qasida, it deals with being far away from home, in a desert, yearning after beautiful women in a neighbouring camp. Golias, even more than Scaliger, sought out Arabic manuscripts in Morocco, Aleppo, and Istanbul. He re-edited Erpenius's grammar in 1656, adding an anthology of Arabic texts and translating the same um, poem, Lamiyat al-Ajam, all in view of making the beauty of the Arabic language available to his students, whom he called the Phil-Arabists. Now here we have a very different picture from that of the 12th, 13th centuries. Meanwhile, Arabic studies were taking root in England. 
Edward Pocock, who had served as chaplain of the English embassy in Aleppo from 1630 to 1636, brought back many Arabic manuscripts from which he edited the history of, uh, section of the history of the Arabs. Bishop William Lord, the chancellor of the University of Oxford, set up a chair in Arabic in 1636 and invited Pocock to be its first holder. Pocock made an Arabic edition and Latin translation of the philosopher's autodidactus of Ibn Dufail, um, the origin, perhaps, of Robinson Crusoe. Um, and here is the, um, the, the, uh, the title page, Philosopher's Autodidactus, or the letter of Abi Jafar ibn Tufail, um, uh, Hai ibn Yakzan, and it's translated from, uh, from Arabic into Latin by Edward Pocock, but um, the Arabic edition was also made by him. Um, he attributed to him his son, but that was because he wanted his son to be promoted to be his successor as um, professor of Arabic in Oxford. Um, in in um, meanwhile, another Arabist, Abraham Wheelock, had been appointed to the first professorship of Arabic in Cambridge, endowed by Thomas Adams in 1533, and he worked on the Quran. Um, but mainly uh, for anti-Islamic reasons. But when we look at the English Arabists, um, we find, as we've already heard from Lorna, um, that as well as involvement in Arabic for the sake of history and philology and to shed light on biblical studies, there was a strong interest in Arabic mathematics and astronomy. In 1637, the same Edward Pocock returned to the east, to Istanbul, to look for more Arabic manuscripts in the company of John Greaves, who was to become the civilian professor of astronomy at Oxford. John Greaves, 1602 to 1552, um, a friend of Goliath in Leiden, trans, um, uh, was searching for manuscripts of Uluq Beg's astronomical tables, which he believed were the most accurate and up-to-date tables of the positions of the stars available. He translated two tables, both those, or specimens of two tables, first of all of those of Ulug Beg, um, whom, as we've heard, um, wa uh, made his observations, or founded the observatory in Samarkand in 1437, and also of an earlier astronomer, Arabic astronomer, Nasir ad-Din Atuzi, who was the observer who was employed um, at an earlier observatory founded by the Mongols in Maraga in the late 13th century. Um, and this is um, a book that uh, resulted from um, John Greaves' Um, work on the tables of Uluq Beg, there's Uluq Beg from the tradition of Uluq Beg, in which he's describing um, the calendars, as it were, of different races, the, um, the Chinese, and the Syro Greeks, the Arabs, the Persians, and the Khorasmians. And this was published, as we can see, in 1650. Thomas Hyde, Pocock's successor as Lordian Professor of Arabic, 1636 to 1703, that's when he held the professorship, uh, and a fellow of the Royal Society, translated the whole of Ulug Beg's star catalogue in 1665. And this is the title page of that too, which also appears in the very fine catalogue, Arabic Roots. Um, Ulug Be uh, sorry, um, um, Thomas Hyde liked to insisted on um, publishing this text in its original language, which in fact in this case is not Arabic but is, is Persian, though in technical term, technical works, um, most of the technical terms are Arabic anyway. Um, and he translated um, this text also into Latin. Finally, Edmund Halley, also a fellow of the Royal Society, um, and the civilian professor of geometry at o Oxford, beside his multifarious activities, including the recognition of the cyclical returns of the comet that was later named after him, 
was responsible for a Latin translation of parts of the works of the Greek geometer Apollonius of Perge that has survived only in Arabic. Um, and here we have uh, one of these texts by Apollonius of Perge um, about the cutting of a, um, a, a cutting of a ratio or proportion. Two books from a, um, a very old Latin Arabic manuscript um, and um, we see down here um, by the work and the study of Edmund Halley in Oxford, um, a work published in um, 1706. This is just a sample of the um, scientific works that these Oxford scholars were interested in and looked to the Arabs for. We've already and been told about the importance of these Arabic works for early fellows of the Royal Society. But I think it's significant that here in the 17th and early 18th century, we come back to the beginning, as it were, of Arabic studies in England, when Adelard of Bath in the early 12th century was interested and was looking himself in Sicily and in the, um, in the Crusader states for mathematical and astronom astronomical texts and was indeed the first to introduce Arabic astronomy, a set of astronomical tables into the Latins. So I shall end there and there's 10 minutes for questions if you wish to have Thank you very much. <laughs>